lot and she's traveled the world with her music. She lives in Vancouver, but she is an island girl through and through. She's our musical guest and we're thrilled to have her on this edition of the show. February is Black History Month. We'll look into that with Chile McGant from the Nanaimo African Heritage Society. Also in the lineup today, Pink Shirt Day is coming on February the 29th. We'll look into the very real and very scary impact of bullying in our community and around the globe, unfortunately. Rotary Week is coming up also, February 23rd to March the 1st. We'll have some information on that. And one of Nanaimo's, one of Nanaimo's 20th most powerful people is here, Wendy Pratt. We'll chat hospice with Dunya Tozi. And you know, we are overflowing with fiddlers in the studio today. There's 18 of them at last count. The Van Isle fiddlers are almost here in their entirety. 18, as I said, at last count. All that and more coming up in the next hour right here on the show. That's the beautiful music of Alexandria Malat, who's here with us today. She's going to come back later with more of her music. But for now, here we have uh, one of the most powerful women in Nanaimo. We've got Wendy Pratt from the Nanaimo Hospice to talk to us about the Nanaimo, about the hospice and the services that they provide. They've been working tirelessly for many years uh, to deal and help people who are with illnesses or uh, to help support those. Uh, their families who are grieving. Um, thank you very much for being here, Wendy. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's wonderful <laughs> to be here. That's <laughs> great. So as we said at the beginning, uh, you were voted one of the most powerful people in Nanaimo, the, one, the, one, the top 20. Yes, well, <laughs> I, I have to say that was a lovely uh, tribute, and especially in this year when we are trying to be more visible with hospice in the community. So I certainly thank the Nanaimo Daily News for including me in that very uh, wonderful group of people. And I'm sure you're very well deserving of that title for sure. Uh, you guys have been working in the community for so long and you do so much to the community but not a lot of people really uh, know what you do and what the hospice provides so, so can you just give us a little bit of an idea of what the hospice is and what you guys do yeah I'd love to um, you know hospice has been in our community for this is our 31st year wow. and our founder passed away very suddenly last year and we looked in, back and reflected over the contributions uh, to the community during that time and in 30 years, hospice has trained over 1,000 volunteers. They've given over 500,000 hours, and over 30,000 people have benefited. And those are people who are dying, they are people who are grieving, and they are people who are caring for a loved one at the end of life. So we have a lot of programs that yeah. we run to support people in our community. And although we deal very closely with these issues of death, caregiving, grieving, we always look at this work as building healthy and strong community. We want to uh, be able to um, allow families to become resilient in very difficult times. We're dealing with a very vulnerable population. And uh, what we want to try and do is work with them to support them through their, um, their time of, of grief and, uh, and loss. Hmm. So it's, yeah. those are difficult times. As you say, it's very difficult. I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, trying to support and, care, you know, talk to somebody who just lost someone. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but what you were telling me earlier is that uh, you're accessible to everybody. It's, you know, sometimes people think, oh, it's only adults. But you do, you have a lot of programs with teens and with kids. Um, is that yes. right? Yes, yes, very much so. Uh, we serve people all the way from age three right up to seniors and we have a variety of programs that work for all age groups and a lot of people just think this is about seniors about forty percent of the people we serve in a year are over sixty five the rest are under that age group and uh, last year we served over three hundred children and teens wow. and that was through counseling 
through group and through um, a variety of educational opportunities in the classroom at school. Mm -hmm. And you've been in Nanaimo, as you said, for 31 years, but you have been, the, the, the population has been expanding, the needs have been uh, increasing. So recently you've announced that you're going to be expanding and changing your location. Yes, and we definitely need to do that. <laughs> I, I said at our launch on Friday that we not only want to do this, we have to do it. We are really bursting at the seams in our present location over on Boundary Avenue. And in order for us to continue to do what we do best, which is working with the dying and the grieving and the caregivers, uh, we do need to move and expand our premises. Our numbers have just grown so quickly in the last 12 years especially. And I do believe a part of that is the baby, the baby boomers mm -hmm. and the, right. uh, their parents moving into this segment of healthcare delivery. But it's also about um, adding those new programs for children and for teens that has really raised the numbers and really made it uh, necessary for us to expand our premises in order to continue to meet the needs of the people who are coming to us for help. Mm -hmm. And you are, where are you moving to? Well, we have found a wonderful property over on uh, Waddington Road. It's the Montessori School property. And um, we have an offer to purchase on that property. It's a $1.25 million project. Right. We still have 900000 to raise. And we are looking to our community to help us with that. It's called Expand the Heart of Hospice. And that's exactly what we intend to do in this community. And you've got here a brochure that I have here that's got all a little bit of information that people can pick up and they can help out, right? Absolutely. They can uh, either go to our website at uh, NanaimoHospice.com or they can come around to our house uh, or they can phone us and we'll mail it out to them. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Uh, you're run mostly by volunteers too, right? You were telling me that you have about... We have 250 here. volunteers and they work with, uh, they work both at the house and in our thrift store but 150 of them work directly with families. And you know, one of the things I did want to say is that unaddressed grief mm -hmm. really does create issues for families in the community. It can undermine the, uh, the family dynamic. It can enter the workplace. It can enter the classroom. So it's very important that we address these issues in our community, and they aren't issues people want to talk about. And, and you've got some really great people that you're working with who are helping you do that. Uh, we are running out of time, but for anybody who's interested in donating and helping out, you can go to the hospice's website at nanaimohospice.com and you can get all the information. You can take a look at the brochure that they have and you can help them out in their expansion. Thank you very much, Wendy, for being here and good luck with the, your expansion and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, up next, well, the studio is beaming today because we have so many people. I think that's a record time. When we've got uh, 18 people, 18 fiddlers are around here. So the, fiddle, the, the Van Al fiddlers are here, and they're going to be uh, playing Hut on Staffen Island. Take it away.
Bloods Hot, Hot on Staten Island. We will hear more from the Fiddler a little later on the show, but right now we are joined to Tom. Uh, February 29th has been proclaimed Pink Shirt Day uh, in British Columbia, and uh, today we're joined by School to 68 School Safe Coordinator Tom Piros. Thank you for coming, Tom. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting uh, me here today. Of course. Uh, so exactly what is your job in this district? Um, I'm a district coordinator of safe schools, and so some of the key strands that I oversee is bully prevention. We also have a threat assessment, keeping our schools safe while the students are there. Uh, building community relationships and partnerships is, is, is a huge piece. And then we um, really work on suicide intervention and prevention protocols. But beyond that, that entails many other facets. But those are some of the, the key district strands that we've prioritized in building healthy and safety school climates. Yeah, so you're wearing this pink shirt. Explain a little bit about that. Absolutely. This, this shirt here is a, is a very special one. I've been in uh, Nanaimo for about a year, and uh, when I go into schools, we talk about that pink shirt day shouldn't just be on that February 29th. It should be every day. So we do a lot of sessions around anti-bullying, and this is from several schools in the district where the youth asked, I just wore it as pink, can we sign it? And so now we have a few of them floating around the school district, and... Um, I, I, I enjoy wearing it and the kids, they, the kids really like them. That's great. So exactly what is Pink Day? How did it originate? Well, Pink Shirt Day is really a culmination of many things. Essentially, the, the first story that be, got a lot of media buzz was back in 2007. And uh, essentially, a, a young grade 9 boy in Nova Scotia was being bullied at school because he wore pink and he liked uh, being diverse in his, uh, in his appearance. And essentially, he was being tormented by school schoolyard bullies. And essentially, uh, a couple of boys in grade 12 said they weren't gonna put up with it. They went and bought 50 pink shirts. They wore them to school and all these kids wore them. And it started a whole trend of safety. All right, so what are schools in our district doing to celebrate this day? Well, you see, uh, in SD68, we think that pink shirt day should be every day. In other words, the February 29th is a wonderful day as a symbol and to reflect upon that. But schools are working on these activities and tasks throughout the year. Some schools right now, which is exciting, NDSS for instance, they've launched an empathy group. And so a leadership group of grade, I believe 11 and 12 students are going into younger grades, doing assemblies on anti-bullying, going into elementary environments. Um, a lot of schools in the communities, that private businesses have purchased shirts, so a whole school will be wearing them and, and staff and that it carries over to contests of uh, being safe and, and building friendships, empathy, kindness, sharing. Um, several other schools are, are hosting virtues where throughout the year they practice different virtues to celebrate safety and this just extends into their daily activities. So a whole bunch of events, we even have a countdown to uh, Pink Shirt Day. We've been running since Christmas time, kind of like a celebration of New Year's. So this is much more than just a one day, really? That's the way we have to look upon it. Yeah, it's exactly. school, community, um, our agencies, private business. It's, this is a societal issue. So for people who are getting bullied in our school district, are there programs in place to help them? Even people who are bullier themselves, are there programs in place? Absolutely. Um, many environments uh, use a variety of different programs. We have ones called WITS and Second Step. And uh, the concrete programs are important, but it's really the school culture and how the school embraces those skills of problem solving, peaceful resolutions, restorative justice and practice. And utilizing those tools, they're able to develop a school culture that teaches all the kids, both uh, the students that are bullied and the, the vast majority of the bystanders who watch this bullying, we really want to empower them to stand up and report. We teach them that it's not ratting. And then we have the actual bullies that they need tools and be readdressed with their behavior. So there's a variety of programs and it really comes we really believe from K all the way to 12. We just don't start teaching it in high school, for instance. So what are some types of bullying? You know, and, uh, there's cyber, physical, what are some main ones we see in our school? See, that's a really good point. Um, traditionally, bullying has been what we call physical and verbal and with intimidation. We refer to it as harassment, intimidation, and bullying, where we often would have a chance along, say, with the police and other agencies and parents to see it. Um, the new the biggest trend right now is the cyberbullying aspect, and our district has really taken a progressive view on that. Mm -hmm. Again, a K-12 model yep. of working with Facebook bullying, texting, intimidation, flaming, and things that are going on site 
essentially 24 seven now. It just doesn't end when the kids go home. The vast majority of our cyberbullying happens outside of school, then the violence plays itself out. Alrighty, thank you, Tom. I'm getting the wrap sign now. Uh, so later on, we're we'll be talking to Constable Sherry Wade about you know, the consequences, but make sure you wear your pink on February 29th to say bullying stops here. We'll be right back, stay tuned. And now, back to the show, only on Shaw TV. You are watching the show right here on Shaw TV Channel 4 in Nanaimo. We produce the show here in our studio live to tape every other Monday with a crew of about 12 volunteers and a handful of staff. Now, thanks for everyone for being a part of it. Thank you for watching and thank you to all the people in the studio who bring the energy alive when we tape every other week. As we heard before the break, bullying is a very serious and a potential deadly occurrence in our community. It happens all too often. Pink Shirt Day is Wednesday, February the 29th, and we're going to throw things over to Tally Campbell now again to look into the consequences for those who don't know that bullying is just unacceptable. Thank you, Kate. Whether you're bullying as a joke or to intentionally hurt someone, there are consequences to faith. We are joined by Constable Sherry Wade uh, to explain some of those consequences. What is your job in this, in this RCP? Sure. Uh, I'm a school liaison officer. There are four of us. And so we look after two high schools each and then all the feeder elementary schools. So we technically look after the kids from kindergarten through to grade 12. Okay. Uh, so how often are you hearing about incidents of bullying at the school level? Uh, pretty, pretty often. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's always been bullying. So whether or not we're just more aware of it now and people are reporting it. Um, sometimes I'm asked to go and speak to a group, a classroom about it. Generally, what I tell them in grade six is uh, by grade six, they probably had six discussions about bullying at least. So if I'm in there in grade six, then it tells me that something else is going on in the classroom. Um, as soon as you get into grade six, grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, we're looking really either at criminal harassment or potentially assault if it's physical, uh, or maybe even uttering threats if someone has threatened to do harm to someone else. So um, from the criminal standpoint, um, we, we look at bullying from all different aspects, adults as well. So what is the definition of bullying in the law system? Well, we don't have a criminal code for bullying, but we do have uttering threats, which would be I, I threatened to harm you. Um, harassment, which would be an ongoing, where you feel like your quality of life has been affected, so you're afraid to go to school, you're afraid to go to work. And then assault, which is I physically harm you. So that would be bullying to its extreme, but we don't have a criminal code for bullying. So what are the consequences? So, you know, say if I'm bullying you, you know, harassing you, what can, yep. what can happen to me? So as a youth, if, if, if we're youth to youth, then um, if you haven't had any contact with police before we would probably look at restorative justice if you've gone through restorative justice and it's not working or, or your behavior is continuing we could look at charges of uttering threats or harassment if we can prove a, a continuation of the offense or assault if there's been physical and we 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 will do that if we think the youth is not is not getting the message so cyberbullying is a big one, you know, me yeah. being a teen myself, I have Facebook and stuff. How can you prove like that someone behind the screen is saying that? Right, so what we tell people is print it out. And what youth need to understand is it's not anonymous and you cannot get rid of it simply by deleting it. So you print it out, you bring it to your teacher, you bring it to the counselor, you bring it to us. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the whole script because I, I have to be honest, I very seldom see a one-sided uh, Facebook conversation. Usually there's some trash talking on both sides and so that's our role is to decipher what happened. I also say to kids, listen, if someone says something nasty to you, do you have to spend six hours explaining why you are not what they said you're not? No, you don't. You can delete it, you can tell your parents, you can. So yes, we see a lot of online stuff. So say I've been bullied, uh, are there some you know, prevention tips, uh, some help that I can get if I was bullied? I would keep talking. So. It, you tell your counselor, tell your parents, keep talking about it. If you don't get the answer you need the first time or the help you need, talk to someone else. Because lots of times you're not the only person who's, who's going through that. Um, and the adults around you can help you develop strategies. We used, to tell, we used to tell kids like just stand up. Well, that doesn't work if we're not there to back you up. It's one thing for an adult to tell a kid to stand up. but and. If you counsel your child to push back, hit back, strike back, you will both be suspended. 
So because the school, there isn't a place for physical violence. So you can't tell your kid, stand up and, and, and fight back because there will be consequences for both. Well, thank you, Consul Sherry Waite, for coming in. You're uh, welcome. Make sure you wear your pink shirt on February 29th to say bullying stops here. Passing over to Matt Carter. Yeah, I think so, yeah. All right, thanks very much, Tally. Um, it's a little bit ironic, I think, that we're talking about bullying on a show when we have the Van Al Fiddlers on, which of course is a group with sax, or no sax, but lots of violins. <laughs> All right, so now to more musical guests. Oh, everyone's groaning over there. Yeah, it's time to introduce our musical guest now, um, a, a decorated, multi-award winning songwriter, performer, a tour all before the age of 19, 19 now. When I was 19, the best thing I could do was not overcook craft dinner. Mm -hmm. Alexandria Mailot, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm so excited to be here. It's amazing. It's I'm, like the Fiddlers. Oh my gosh. I can't even, I can't even get over it. They're amazing. Yeah, very, very cool group. And again, shows, I mean, you included the, uh, the talent that's around in Vancouver Island. Interesting though, like you were born in Prince George, if I read yes. correctly, living in Vancouver now, but um, basically grew up all over Vancouver Island, estimated yes. moved about 25 times in 19 years. Yeah, give or take 25 times. Our, our family just always moved around for different you know, career opportunities and whatnot, so we never really stayed in one spot for more than two years. So I did grow up in Vancouver Island, though. That's definitely where I, I consider myself to be, you know, home. That's where home is. Yes, exactly. That's, yes. that's awesome. All right, so um, other stuff you want to talk about. Uh, in terms of what I read in your bio, a lot of what you mentioned is the, your determination to yes. be, make it in the music industry. Absolutely. So tell us, like, what is it? It's more than skills, it's determination. Does that come through in your music at all? I think, yeah, it definitely does because, I mean, I'm an independent artist. There's no one behind me. There's no, you know, I'm independently funded and, and I've worked from the ground up. There's no one in my family who's musically inclined. And so, I mean, over the years, I've developed a thick skin and I've been doing this since I was probably like seven or something like that nice. and I mean and over the years I mean it's just it's just prominent that you have to you know just go out there and make opportunities happen for yourself they don't just come and fall in your lap um, and yeah I mean I'm just a very determined person in it and I want to make music and and the entertainment business my career mm -hmm. so I've just been working my butt off. Yeah. Well, <laughs> to again, make that yeah, happen. exactly. And some of the stuff you've done, you played at the Merritt Mountain Music Fest. Uh, you sang on TV with Jan Arden, yes. which would make my mom very jealous. Oh, geez. <laughs> and one of the other cool things you've done is a song that you wrote or wrote or co-wrote. You can tell us actually became a hit in Europe. Yes. So what was the story behind writing that song and how it got big in Europe? I wrote the song when I was 12 years old, I believe. And I went and worked with the producer who helped me write the song, and my sister actually helped me write it as well. And it was my first professionally recorded song I ever recorded. And someone heard it. I had submitted it into a, a competition called the We Are Listening Songwriting Competition, which I ended up winning a few years later. But I didn't win that year, but I made it into the finals. And, and someone had heard it and had taken an interest in it, and he was working with an artist in Europe, and she was um, a Swiss artist named Stephanie Heinzman. And she won kind of the, the German Idol equivalent of American Idol. Oh, nice. So yeah, they were looking for music to put on her debut album, and they really liked my song, so we you know, cut a deal and it, it went over to Europe, and the YouTube video has over a million hits now, so it's kind oh, of nice. interesting. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, and you yourself have a new album coming out. Yes. Uh, tell us the story behind that. Well, it's a long time coming. I've been working on it basically since I was 12. And um, it's basically just, you know, a story of a girl going through high school, growing up. It's kind of a girl's journal, I guess you could say. Um, just, you know, a lot of things about life, love, and lessons. And it's my first debut album, so I'm super excited about it. And yeah, it's almost finished, so I'm really excited. It's nice. going to be coming out around late February, early March. For sure. All right, so yeah, the album called Just Another Girl. Yes. Correct. And now I guess we're going to hear a song from that uh, album coming out yes. called That Swell featuring yes. the ukulele. So quickly, just a bit of background behind the song and we'll get into it. Well, I was listening to a lot of uh, Mama and Cass from the Mama and Papas, and I just really love romantic songs. I absolutely love it. And I just wanted to write a song on the ukulele um, that just really uplifted people and made them feel good and just want to tap their feet and whatnot. So. Nice. Awesome. All right, well, let's take a listen. Alexander Mela, check out alexandermela.com for videos, blog information, when the albums come out, tour dates, all that sort of stuff. Alexander, over to you. That's Swell here on the show, Shaw TV, Channel 4. Quite the move to fulfill. 
just the finishing touches on that swell from Alexandria Malott. Thank you very much. And you've been hanging out here for a while. We're going to hear from Alexandria some more uh, later on in the show. So don't go anywhere. You are watching the show right here on Shaw TV Channel 4. And I'm just going to do a little call out because my dad watches the show all the time and he critiques my performance. And he said that this pen in my hand drove him crazy because he wanted to know what I was going to do with it. So dad, I'm putting the pen away. That's for you. This show was designed to give volunteers an opportunity to get hands-on experience in the production of locally based community television and many of those volunteers are behind the scenes. There's a half a dozen of them here today or probably more like a dozen of them here in the studio today and some of those volunteers prefer to be in front of the camera. They work their way to interviews here in the studio and one of those people is Bob Fenty. He's a very dedicated community volunteer. He's active on a lot of different fronts. I've known him for years. I think he was one of the first people I met in Nanaimo and he's very, very passionate about Rotary. Here's Bob Fenty. Thank you very much, Kate. And yes, it, it is uh, definitely a, a great opportunity for me to be on your show talking about Rotary. And, and we have with us today Bill Brendan, who is the president of the Rotary Daybreak Club. And he's also the chairman of the Rotary Week Committee. And we're planning a great celebration coming up very soon. And, and Bill, tell us, what is it that Rotary Week it really is all about? Well, uh, Bob, Rotary Week uh, is about Rotary in the Nanaimo area, and that's Nanaimo, Lanceville. There are five Rotary clubs, and uh, the community of Nanaimo and Lanceville has always enjoyed their work. They, in this week, starting off February 23rd, will be celebrating Rotary and the effect of Rotary as volunteers in this community. We're going to show off a little bit during that week. We've got multimedia public relations efforts, including this, uh, to help us kick off the fact that, uh, that Rotary is uh, there about informing the community, uh, inspiring the community to do good work, and uh, that Rotarians are inviting people in that week, possibly to become members of Rotary. And uh, what, what, do, uh, our, what would our viewer, viewers expect to see and learn about uh, Rotary during this week of celebrations, Bill? The, um, the celebration is, uh, is going to be about uh, showing the people who uh, are invited by Rotary to a special meeting uh, at uh, the Legion 256, 1630 Wellington Road East in, in Nanaimo uh, on the Thursday 
afternoon, five o'clock, two hour meeting. We're gonna show people who are invited to that meeting by Rotarians what Rotary has accomplished. Uh, and I think you said uh, the, the Nanaimo Club, the first Rotary Club in, in Nanaimo has been at it for 80 years. Uh, we're gonna show a profile of what it's accomplished. And we're gonna, sh we're gonna show the other clubs in Nanaimo as well. There are five clubs in total that have been working on various projects. So there's, there's so many clubs in Nanaimo, and, and I'm sure there's, how many Rotarians would we have, roughly, Bill, very uh, quickly? It varies between 200 and 250. Wow. And this, this special presentation that we're looking at this week of Rotary, is it a, a, a big birthday celebration? As well, at that celebration, ah. there's going to be a birthday for Paul Harris, the original founder. Uh, was now I'm not sure if it was exactly February 23rd he was born I think it was the 25th but we've picked yeah, that we're night close for enough. practicality. We're close enough. But his uh, his initiation of Rotary in the first place uh, 107 years ago. 1905 was when it started wasn't it? Okay yeah and the birthday party for Paul is going to be celebrated for Rotarians and their guests. So where can we find more information Bill on, on if, if somebody wanted to attend the functions that are going to be planned this week for the Rotary Week where can we go? Uh, there is a website which shows in a brief directory format the five clubs. It's called rcnl.ca. So rcnl.ca and uh, the phone number, which I think uh, Shaw is going to put up on the screen as it's well. on the screen right now. It's 250-741-9222 and there will be a, a person who can answer what Rotary is about in terms of each of those five clubs, when they meet, and uh, when a person who wants to get involved can go to a Rotary meeting. Super. Bill, thank you so much for taking time to come and, and join us on the show and tell us more about Rotary Week and what we can expect. And now let's listen to those fiddlers. They were doing a great okay. job before. And actually the, the next song they're going to play for us is called Snow Deer and I sure hope there's no snow coming this way. Fiddlers, let's hear snow. they do nice the Van Isle Fiddlers with Snow Deer now they're perhaps better known on a national level as across Canada fiddle now we're joined now by Edna Chadwick and Trish Clare 
For, it other was way. other way around. Edna's yeah. here. <laughs> Trish is here. Yeah. Um, really interesting. You you started the piece and then you slipped out and you're still there directing them and I can still see all their eyes <laughs> looking over to see was that you, you're keeping them on time and, and they're used to you looking at you for that. Camera it's fear. Used to it. Camera fear. Yes, and it is getting really <laughs> warm in here. Uh, what is who are the Van Al fiddlers? You could talk about that, I think. Um, well, we're a group that started about eight years ago. About eight years ago. By Trish. Um, and we started um, in Nanaimo, and there's four of us. And Just four? Yeah, and Trish thought she was going to have to close this group down because there wasn't enough, and then wow. we just started expounding from there, and now we're up to 40 or 50. 40 or 50, and we've got 18 plus of them here yeah. today. So Trish, what, was, what do you attribute the huge growth to then? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, I teach classical violin as well, and I started to notice about 10 years ago that kids maybe didn't always want to practice their Beethoven or right. Bach, but they sure were inspired by things like Riverdance and Alshim McIsaac and Natalie McMaster and that sort of energy in the music I think is really captivating. And I think also the social aspect of this group in particular, you know, that this is a group of, it's a community, people who I know Our one victims. of the members of the group is Kelly Etheridge and her mm -hmm. son's here today and yeah. I follow her on Facebook and she's always talking about uh, going to the fiddle camps and going to practices and going to rehearsals and I did get the sense that it is very, very social and right. yet there, it's all age, age ranges as well so it's, it's quite yeah. family oriented and yeah. tell me a bit about the camaraderie that happens within um, the group. Well, we're about, um, the age group is about 8 to 70. Yep. And uh, we really get along well, you know, we, we really look forward to Thursday night. and Every week, every Thursday? Every week, yeah. Every Thursday. Uh, this is the advanced group, there's four groups. Okay. Beginners, intermediate, advanced, which is this one. And then we've got a new group called this, we've we don't trying know. to figure out a name for them, but we're calling them the super kids right now because they're a bunch of teen uh, teenagers, okay. preteens and teenagers. Yeah. And, uh, so there's four groups and we meet Thursdays, yeah, Me. lots of fun. Now how is Van Al Fiddlers connected to Cross Canada Fiddle? Are they the same thing? Well, Van Al Fiddlers is, uh, is the name that we've given to the groups that we teach here in Nanaimo. Cross Canada Fiddle is the company that my partner Jeff and I have and it's a company that is focused on education, music education across Canada. So Jeff used to have a studio in Ottawa where he taught fiddle and piano. And, and I hear he's actually recognized as, a, as one of the best piano players. He is players. one of the best piano players. Yeah. He's played with all the best in Canada. So If you weren't we're going to brag about it, I was. No, okay, well, you can feel free, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so we're lucky to have him here now. And Jeff and I also taught in uh, the Northwest Territories and the Yukon quite extensively. So we thought the name Cross Canada Fiddle was uh, just fitting. Uh, we've got about two minutes left. H how often do you perform? I know you get together for rehearsals and, and gatherings every week. How often do you play for the public? But maybe about once every couple of months. Okay. Um, our goal would be to do it once a month. We'd actually love to have you know community barn dances where the fiddlers are providing the music and we're having a community family dance for all ages. Uh, I get the sense you'll get there. I think yeah, you guys I think so. Cool. It's growing yeah, and it's, yeah. it's We had one great. last week. It was lots of fun. All you know, kids yeah. dancing and. You know, the old band dance is really a lot of fun. Do you find that, this is sort of a little bit off, but that, that the parents have to be into music in order to get your kids into music? Are the two connected? Not necessarily. No. no, I don't think that the parents have to be, you mean, musical themselves? Yeah. No, no, absolutely not. What's essential is that they're supportive, you know, and that they're willing to drive their kids all over town because there's a whole lot of kids here <laughs> whose parents have to you know, shuttle them around yeah. and... I'm a fiddle mom instead of a soccer exactly. mom. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yes, you have yeah. to choose. Yeah. It can't be both. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, one of the two, uh, big things you do every year, March, uh, fiddle camp. A fiddle you camp. got a minute mm -hmm. left. Yeah. What is fiddle camp? Uh, this is our sixth year running a camp. Uh, my sixth year... Whoa, hello, this microphone. <laughs> um, being administrator of a camp. And it used to be called a fiddle camp, and we recognize that there's people who don't just play fiddle, but there's guitar and piano and penny whistle and mandolin and all sorts of things. And we get together for four days at Seven Springs Resort in the News Bay and learn about playing traditional music together and all sorts of different styles and teachers from across the country. So. Thank you ladies for coming today. We do have your website posted throughout the interview um, and we'll refer people to Cross Canada Fiddle for more information on how to get involved and how you can participate in the upcoming fiddle camp in March. We'll have more from the Van Al Fiddlers later in the show. It's over now though to a young woman who knows that it takes an awful lot of skill to play the fiddle. And so here now is Alexandria Malott on a guitar with Take It Off. <laughs> Friends, 
start beginning to shine Galaxy far away in time Where did we begin? A shimmer of light flashes all around Making a life doesn't make a sound Take it all, want to know Nobody's perfect, but I'm really worth it Take it all, want to know Nobody's perfect, but I'm really A brand new world begins to turn With lessons in life and love to learn Where do we begin? Break it down where we'll be found Face to face lying down Where do we fit in? Take it Take it all, want to know, nobody's perfect, but I'm really worth it. Take it all, want to know, nobody's perfect, but I'm really from her one more time later on the show. February is Black History Month. It's a busy time for the Nanaimo African Heritage Society. Shalai McGant and Devin Wyatt, Devlin, pardon me, are here representing the society. And there are many events that have taken place uh, in the first part of February. There's a few more that take us right through to the end of February. Depends on, on when you're watching this actual broadcast. And it's all in celebration. All the events are in celebration of Black History Month. It's uh, a month that is celebrated in Canada and in the U.S. in February. And it's celebrated in the U.K. in October. Shalema, thank you for coming today. We're going to start off with what is the objective of hosting an entire month celebrating? We'll get to you in a minute, Devlin. <laughs> uh, what is the objective of hosting the entire month in, in recognition and celebration? Well, Kate, thanks for having us here. Celebrating black history is just celebrating part of our culture that has been here in, as long as anybody else's culture. Um, we celebrate um, because there's a lot of history and uh, information that a lot of people don't know that is in our own community. Mm -hmm. So celebrating hi uh, black history is uh something that is definitely necessary. And it's something, as I mentioned, that takes place in, in, in the entire country and 
it spreads down into the United States, the United Kingdom as well. So there's a need in all communities internationally to recognize the contribution that that black pioneers is is that the right way to yes, black pioneers. I, I think it you know unfortunately um, part of us, a lot of us, uh, uh, our history comes from. Um, in degradation where there was slavery and things like mm -hmm. that. Because of those kind of things, a lot of information was not told in our schools and a lot of people grow up with, um, uh, you know, la a lack of inter information about black pioneers. Mm -hmm. But far as Nanaimo is concerned, our pioneers go back in the 1800s. They were part of um, they were part of the land breaking. This was a territory in the 1800s and we had lots of black pioneers that came here and helped to pioneer the land like anybody else did. Mm -hmm. And Devlin, do you think it's working? Uh, do you think there's, it's been quite a few years in Nanaimo that the Nanaimo um, Black Heritage Society, African Heritage Society has been putting on the celebrations throughout the month. Is it, are things changing? Are we making, are you making a difference? Oh, yeah. Things are definitely progressing. Every year there's more information that uh, is brought to the surface, there's more people that get interested in it, so more years are learning as the years go on. Uh, the content remains the same, but the stories, the stories are, are the same. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, Black History Month, a lot of people uh, misrepresent it and they think, oh, well that's not my history. Right. But, uh, you know, the actual side of it is that Yes, these black pioneers helped shape the land. They are part of our history. Everybody's history. It's everybody's history. Canada's yeah. history. And it, right. it's, it's good to recognize it. And how have the events been going? People are going to watch this at all different times. Some people will see this uh, sort of third week in February. Other people will be watching it right at the end of February. So it's hard to get specific onto one event. But you've had a couple, if not more, by this point. How's it going? Well, I tell you, every year we're just astounded at how everything unfolds. We had a wonderful start off at the museum. Yes. Um, the mayor was there and declared a proclamation declaring Black History Month in February. And that was the first? That and was the first uh, kickoff event. And then we moved right along with the uh, community partners with the ballet, the Cuban ballet and the Port Theater. That was just, just enormously uh, successful. Um, and uh, now this weekend we have two events coming up. Um, Lawrence will um, um, Lawrence Waldron. Waldron, thank you. Will be showing some wonderful art exhibit at the um, Nanaimo Arts Council, and that's in the Northtown Mall. Right. And we'll move on to our gospel concert, which is the 19th at the Brecon United Church. A lot of those gospel enthusiasts come out and hear the Sojourners, and we have um, Chico and the VOC Victoria Soul Gospel Concert uh, yep. Choir. So, and then we kick off on the 26th with our finale. So there's lots more to come out and see and support the society, learn more about the black culture, and certainly enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we get wrapped up and we are getting, I've uh, got about a minute left, and I know that some of the dates you mentioned there, if people are watching near the end of the month, um, will already be gone, but certainly there's time to participate in the finale, depending on when you're watching this. Um, and I think we need to remind ourselves that you don't have to go out because something is connected to Black History Month or because something is connected to the Francophone Association or because something, just go out to enjoy for what it is. Our community. And, right? The, the things that yeah. we do in the community. We're all a tapestry of Canada and we need to, I, I think for me, I love embracing other cultures. Yeah. I learn more about going out and enjoying what our community have to offer. Mm -hmm. It's all about entertainment, these wonderful people that you have here in this beautiful soulful singer I think <laughs> uh, so it's all about just enjoying the arts the culture yeah. celebrating the community I thank you both for being here today I know that it's an extremely busy time for you it's a labor of love I, is it just the two of you uh, well we got board of directors that show up when the time is right right so. <laughs> right I know how that works and yeah. most of the labor it's a labor of love I'm sure falls on Shalema and Devlin's shoulders. So thank you so much for today and Thanks for, for bringing black thank history you. and awareness here to our community. Now we've had some rearranging in the script, so I'm going to do things as scripted with whichever script we might be working from at the moment, which is throwing things over. I'm getting a sign behind. We're going back over to the Van Al Fiddlers, but we will hear from Alexandria Malat one more time. Van Al Fiddlers.
just about finished with our show. Thank you so much to the Van Al Fiddlers for bringing so much energy into our studio today and for setting a record for the highest number of people from one group in one time on one show. It was fun, it was crazy, it was all good, it always is. You are watching the show here on Shaw TV Channel 4. We're just about ready to finish things up. If you'd like to volunteer behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, all that information will follow through on the credits for you. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We've got one more song from Alexandria Malott. It is the Cupcake Song. <laughs> To make me a strawberry cupcake, a cheesecake, filling and a ribbon on top. If I asked for something so sweet, would you make me a cupcake to eat? Would you bake me a pumpkin spice cupcake, cream cheese, and such as a grandma would make? If I asked for one little treat, would you make me a cupcake to eat? Cute as can be, the only thing cuter is you to me. Could you make it taste like French toast topped with your coconut icing that I love the most? If I asked for one little treat, would you make me a cupcake to eat? Would you try out some tiramisu on a chocolatey muffin with your feeling to boot? If I asked.